What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. It's another brand new episode of Liam Picks Fights Live, and we are joined once again by a great guest. You know him. You've loved him the last couple weeks. We're doing it all over again. We had a very successful week last week, so he's back once again. Just win, baby, in the house. Brother, how are you today? Good, Liam. How you doing, mate? <laughs> Man, I'm doing excellent. I got to say, UFC Vegas 69, not the greatest card in the world on paper, but I've had a decent enough time breaking this down. Thought that there were some, you know, interesting wrinkles as I did my research here that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So we got a lot of people in the chat. We got a lot of people fired up to talk about one of the worst UFC cards of the year, one of the worst UFC cards in recent memory. Um, so let's do it once again. We're going to start in the flyweight division. Juan Camilo Ronderos taking on Clayton Carpenter. And this is one of those fights where I feel like Right off the rip, I was surprised by some of what I saw in the research here. I was expecting Juan Camilo Ronderos to be a complete uh, nothing. And the reason being was, you know, he was priced like he was a nothing when he was fighting David Dvorak. He got cleaned up in the first round. He got rocked on the feet in that fight. Then he gets taken to the ground, easily submitted there. So some definite cause for concern, but he's been out of the cage for a while. I listened to an interview that he did with the All-Star. Shout out to uh, John over there. Um he did a great interview with him, got a lot of interesting information where he basically said he's saving $4,000 a month by eating every meal at the PI, by doing everything through the PI that he possibly can, physical recovery, all this stuff. And then he's training consistently at Extreme Couture. He was coaching there when he had a freak injury, he said, which he didn't disclose exactly what the freak injury was, but that's what kept him out of the octagon in part. Then he said he told the UFC he was ready to fight in November. And they basically told him in November, all right, we'll give you a date in February. So he's kind of been sidelined for a while, but ready to go. So he's been putting in basically like six month plus training camp for this date. So I think all that being said, he's fighting a guy who came in off a very competitive fight on contender series. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I feel like I might have a small bet on uh, Chires there. I think he was the underdog. And um, Clayton Carpenter, he was getting rocked cleanly on the feet on a number of occasions in that fight. Uh, tough kid. He was able to deal with it. Had some pretty funky transitions uh, in the fight. Also looking back through his history, he trains with Kyler Phillips. He trains with the MMA lab, has some interesting submissions on the regional scene as well. So he's a talented kid, but I think it's pretty, you know, aggressive to price him as such a big favorite here uh, in his first UFC opportunity. Uh, but what do you think of this one? Yeah, maybe his price a little bit too big. And um, you're right. He was getting tagged a little bit on his um, Dana White contender series fight. But um, like you say, man, this Ronderous guy is a complete bum. He's been living off the um, UFC PI for the last however many months. Um, I watched that interview also. Um, I bet on him in his debut against Dvorak, and um, so did Mo Moyes Audio. Um, we both discussed that one. We bet the sub. And he got finished by a one-arm rear naked choke, man. Um, I think he's very limited. I think it's extremely funny that he's with Extreme Couture, you know, a notorious uh, wrestling gym and his wrestling is just shit. And that's his bread and butter wrestling. He has no hands. He's going to look to clinch in this fight within a minute. Um, and I think Carpenter's too athletic, um, too wise to it. He has far superior jujitsu. And I think he's going to, um, he's going to wrap him up. And uh, I like the sub in this one. I just think um, Rondras isn't UFC caliber and he's got no hands to trouble Carpenter. Um, I do think Carpenter's limited and he will get found out. But um, this guy ain't the one, man. So, yeah, I like submission. Yeah, and you know what I found interesting here? I'm going to check what the price is. I had mentioned to you uh, in the DMs before the show, I thought that the ends by sub was kind of interesting just because you know that both these guys are willing to get into those grappling exchanges. It's about plus 165 here on the fight to end by sub. Not really a great number. What is uh, what is the price on uh, Carpenter sub? Plus 280. Yeah, so you're really looking at pretty – pretty uh, nerf numbers here on the sub but yeah i do agree it's probably the most likely outcome both guys looking to engage there, willing to engage there, prone to making mistakes probably uh pretty inexperienced guys for the ufc level you know combined less than 12 fights it's just not really a lot to work with but i will say they both have some amateur experience as well uh one of the big red flags for me though right off the rip just from a um you know outsider standpoint here because i don't have any bets on the fight yet is 95 percent of the tapology votes are on carpenter so everybody's already uh you know got a foregone conclusion here uh that carpenters aside the line doesn't necessarily reflect that level of confidence but either way that's probably just because it's a dana white contender series debutante uh people are going to look to fade that 
but it looks like the action has been pretty much one way um, towards the underdog here. It opened minus 350. Now it's down to about a market average of minus 317. So, um, you know, basically balanced out at about a minus 300 here, 75% indication. I think that maybe that's going to look fair in hindsight if Carpenter just gets the takedowns. But I think if these guys are exchanging on the feed, it's going to look ugly, 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 uh, and probably could go either way. Yeah, another thing to mention, um, his best win, Rondurus, was um, Eric Shelton, who's obviously been in the UFC. He was on tough. They had a five-ring fight, and um, Rondurus got their split decision. It was an absolute robbery, anyone who's seen that fight. Um, Chris Lee was one of the judges. Um, so even his best win on the regionals um, was a mistake. Um, don't, don't overthink Dude, can it. Can I tell you the truth? I watched that fight just uh, before we got on the show, and yeah. I did not stay to hear the decision. I was sure that he lost. So I was just like, oh, he, he lost that fight. He was getting taken down the whole fight. Like Even he knew wow. he lost that fight. Shelton as well. He had him in um, rear naked choke um, positions. But as we know, Shelton don't finish anybody. He loves going to a split. Um, so, yeah. And I like that line for uh, Carpenter. So what you say, plus 280. I think that's not yeah. bad um, against a complete bum like this. So, yeah, I'll be I feel it. you. I feel you. But the one thing I'll say is you got to remember – this guy got absolutely – I'm talking about uh, Ronderos now. He got absolutely rocked on the feet by Dvorak as well. He's not known for being a power puncher. Uh, so that's the other problem here is this carpenter yeah, yeah, can, yeah. can knock him out on the feet, uh, especially if he hasn't improved his hands. I'm looking right now. Carpenter by knockout, also a completely nerfed price. It's plus 240. So they're sharp to you know Carpenter probably finishing uh, this fight. I think that that would be the UFC's goal outcome here. But I do think Ronderos is going to offer him some resistance. Um, you know, he's got to fight to keep that uh, PI membership going. So um, <laughs> going to get a spirited effort, I'm sure. Anyways, next up, we got AJ the Ghost Fletcher taking on Themba Gorimbo. And this this fight, I got to say, was one of my favorite uh, to look into as well. Reason being, gorimbo has got a funny fighting style, man. The guy is absolutely wild. Uh, he throws everything at you. He's coming at you with the kitchen sink. He's got a lot of confidence. Um, I think that those are all, you know, good attributes. AJ Fletcher is going to have the skill advantage on the ground from everything that I've seen so far, uh, in the tape here. Um, you know, AJ Fletcher has been doing some competitive grappling matches with full-time professional grapplers, um, from the EBI system. I thought that was pretty impressive. Couldn't find results for any of those matches for whatever it's worth. I looked, uh, and, and couldn't find the, uh, end result, but Saw some tape where he was able to get out of some dicey positions uh, on somebody that had a little bit of length on him. He's going to have a very uh, low reach against everybody. He's going to be at a reach disadvantage against everybody in the division. He's not a very well-built person for fighting except on the ground because on the ground, he's pretty heavy. He could pass positions. Uh, and again, he's got a weird build that's hard to get a hold of. You try and triangle this guy, he's got big shoulders that he could introduce into the choke. But that being said, you know, I think that with an eight and a half inch reach advantage on a plus 235 underdog, it's always going to pique my attention. I'm going to have to look a little bit further into that fight. And AJ Fletcher, you know, he kind of high rolled that fight on contender series a little bit, right? He came in with the flying knee, blasted that guy. He was kind of getting hit in that fight. It was a competitive fight. He got hit with a, a couple clean left hooks. The other guy wasn't that good, and then he got put down bad. He was a favorite in that fight, supposed to win there, minus 145, surprised people with the big knockout. But then Themba on the other side, you know, I think he's coming in with no expectations. People think he's overhyping himself. He's got the belt on. He definitely looks, you know, like a guy who could be, uh, you know, Fugazi. But I also think when you talk about A.J. Fletcher being at this huge reach disadvantage, he's gotten hit cleanly in every fight he's ever had, basically. You know, the kid's not super developed. He was a football player and then decided, I'm going to pick up MMA. You know, I don't think he's been training in the premier training destinations in the United States, let's say, um, where a lot of the best people congregate, where the highest skilled athletes are. He's moved around. He's gotten some looks, right? He's got some UFC backing. But the same thing can be said for Themba. You look at not necessarily all the guys he trains with, but he's taking pictures with every UFC fighter there is all around the world. Says Leon's the only 170 pounder he likes, took a picture with him too. And I'm just thinking to myself, this guy Themba is basically a finished product. He's 32 years old. This is his opportunity in the UFC. They didn't even bring him in through the contender series model, which is how they normally get cheap labor. They sign this guy. They're giving him a matchup that he could win. It's not a matchup that's a gimme. He's going to get tested here. He's probably going to get taken down in the early going. But if he's able to work back to his feet, I also think that, number one, 
he's probably going to have at least some submission offerings from his back in this fight because he's got super long limbs and he's dealing with somebody who's really short and stocky and makes some mistakes on the ground, puts himself in some danger, chooses to uh, bring on some risk. And I think on the feet, both guys are liable to get knocked out here. Neither one of them has very good defense. They both swing heavies and they both take chances and take risks. And I think that at a big plus 20, uh, you know, plus 225, plus 235 kind of indication, I got to be honest, I'm looking dogger pass in this fight. Um, AJ Fletcher, I bet him big uh, in his first fight against Semmelsberger. I thought easy fight. He's going to take this guy down at will. He didn't take him down at will. He kind of gassed out. He looked very hittable on the feet. He looked tepid on the feet, timid on the feet at times. The guy swings heavies, but I don't think he's very confident when he has to get into extended exchanges. And I think that Themba could run himself onto something big, but he could also just force this guy into a bad situation where he's at a reach disadvantage. He takes a terrible shot and he puts himself in something stupid. So I think for all those reasons, uh, dogger pass for me. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, that was pretty in depth, man. You pretty much covered everything. Um, I've bet Fletcher before. I bet Ang Lusa against him at something like plus 140. So that was a nice cash. Um, he's got his problems, Fletcher. Um, I think that Dana White contender series flying knee was um, pure luck. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, that isn't happening. I think he just caught the guy. I think he's primarily a takedown guy, you know, um, Joe Selecki type minus the um, good jiu-jitsu. Um, yeah, he just wants to take people down, really. And he is strong, man. In that first round, he's strong. He's heavy. I think it's going to um, happen for him in the first round here, and it's up to him to finish. If I've got a bet on him, though, and it come, it gets out of the second round, um, I might start sweating a little bit. But round one, um, Fletcher um, sub should be the play. I think he will get top control over this guy. He is big, you know, black, scary guy, but... Um, and he is the finished product, but his product is just uh, so bad, man. His striking's poor. Um, he does have some opportuni opportunistic submissions, you know, guillotines. I've seen him hit. But they was on, like, 0-2 fighters, um, you know, in Zimbabwe. So, yeah, I think Fletcher gets it done. But I I'm probably will stay away because, like I say, Fletcher has got his problems and um, he is a bit of a liability. But um, I don't see this guy, um, Garimbo, troubling him, to be honest. Yeah, and what, what's interesting to me is just that I think people have seen Garimbo have these flaws, these mistakes, and Fletcher really, uh, since he's been in the public eye, he's put on fun competitive fights. You know, people know him as a UFC brand, but has he set himself apart as somebody that's going to go far in the UFC? I, I just haven't been seeing that. I see a guy who's probably going to have a couple fun fights in the UFC and get shipped back to the regional scene to come back in a couple years if he improves, you know? So for me, that's the kind of thing where – could I catch this guy his last fight in the UFC as a, a big favorite another time face planting? That's kind of my theory of betting. And so sometimes I get burnt and I look like an asshole and the guy just gets flatlined in the first round like he's supposed to. And that could very well happen here. But I also just have seen enough in terms of the fight IQ mistakes from AJ Fletcher to think uh, Garimbo uh, would be my play here. Um, also, you know, this is a welterweight fight, right? AJ Fletcher doesn't have exemplary defense. Plus 1,200 to win by knockout market wide. Fuck out of here. Fuck. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm playing that. I'm in fact, I'm in, I'm betting that right now. I I'm hear you, but right Semi and Lusa uh, are decent opponents and they didn't really um, trouble Fletcher, you know, um, touch him up on the feet. I'm so, pretty sure uh, Semi landed over 100 significant strikes against him. Did he? Standing? Let me pull. Let me pull. I remember they rolled around a lot. Um, no, it was Angelusa. I'm bugging. Angelusa landed 129 significant strikes and two takedowns in 15 minutes. Ooh. Yeah, but I think he got a lot of top control, though. Um, I don't think that was standing. Yeah, I yeah he had five minutes of top control. Yep. Uh, 23 out of 26 on the ground. 95 of 189 at distance. So he landed a lot of distance, too. I just he just has no defense. <laughs> no, he doesn't. I just think he's the lesser of the two evils here. I'm staying away from it, but um, I understand the dog shot on it. You're probably right, dog will pass. Um, obviously, Pat Love Page it. doesn't agree. <laughs> I, I think it's crazy, though, because you got the ITD price at like plus 475, best available for Garimbo. Um, yeah. And then you're seeing plus 1,200 on the knockout. Again, just like historical averages at welterweight, I think that that's probably farcical. You know, I don't think yeah. that that makes sense.
He just seems uh, to have power. Um, just lacks technique. Um, but he just exact, have... It's not very refined, but he's throwing hammers at your head, and he's got yeah. an eight-and-a-half-inch reach advantage. It's like if he wants to throw, the other guy can't do anything except try and duck under it and take him down. So I'm yeah. like, that That for me is enough to take the shot at plus 1,200. But um, I do agree with you. Fletcher's path, sub, look for the sub prop, look for the sub early. It's over 3-1, to one, as opposed to Carpenter, who, again, is like new to the UFC, could have those jitters, could end up wrestling to a decision, this kind of thing, could end up striking it out to a decision like he did on Contender Series. Um, mm. But in in uh, most cases, he's going to look to pursue it on the ground. Fletcher, he has to pursue it on the fucking ground. He's got an eight-and-a-half-inch reach disadvantage. If the guy wants to touch him from out at range, he can. So, you know, it's going to be him looking for takedowns all night, I assume. Um, yeah. And for DraftKings purposes, you know, I'm not the biggest DraftKings guy, but something to consider for y'all uh, that are getting down that way. Um, next up, man, 205 pounds, fun fight. Um, Ovin St. Pru, Felipe Linz, who's still relevant in the UFC uh, at this stage? That's really the question being asked by this fight because OSP, former title challenger, it's been on hard times. I mean, it could have lost to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the guy who was going around calling himself Shogun Hua lately. You know what I'm saying? Like, Shogun Hua, the legend, is like a memory that lives in our mind. And then this guy that's been fighting for a long time after that is who OSP was just going life and death with. Big problem. Huge problem. Um, for me, at least, when I'm looking to back somebody. Now, that being said, uh, I pointed out on Twitter earlier this week, if you guys don't follow me, at Liam Picks Fights, I try and tweet out interesting information about fights in the lead up. But uh, OSP quietly has been profitable in the UFC. People have been betting on him. You know, you haven't been getting rich. But you've been making that stock return, like stocks over time, like average six to eight percent return. That's what you're getting. You know, you're getting about that six to eight percent return, that nice little return on investment with OSP. I think that's why people are coming to market um, on OSP money line here. Felipe Linz has been pretty unreliable. He's he's not fought exemplary. Um, I think uh, who is that that finished him? Tanner Bozer, uh, not a notorious power puncher. Um, so some real concerns on that side as well, but then I don't know, man, I, I think that he looks a lot fresher in the recent fights. I think that the takedown upside is there. I think that OSP, he's a good guy when he's on top. He's not a very good grappler when he's on the bottom position. I think he's liable there. Um, so I think if Linz pursues takedowns, he can get off that way. But I also think on the feet, he's probably just a little bit faster, a little bit sharper at this point in their career. Um, uh, not a spring chicken himself, but just looked a little bit fresher, I thought, in his last fight uh, than what I saw from OSP. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, to, to make it um, simple, I think that the play on this one is the under one and a half. You can get it at plus 170. I think that's a good bet. I think Linz probably knocks him out, um, but obviously that covers um, OSP countering him with like a check hook or something like he did on uh, Manifield. Um, that was beautiful. I, I cashed on. One of my favorite knockouts. I cashed that yeah. too. <laughs> Yeah, that just tells you everything about Menefield. He just ran out of ideas, rushed in, went to sleep. Um, yeah, so I bet against Linz in his last fight. Um, you know, he's withdrawn from like the last eight with medical issues or um, injuries. You know, go check his topology. It's it's something special, that, uh, that record. So, yeah, I bet against him in his last fight against the guy who's fighting uh, on this card. Is it Marcin Prachnio? Uh, when he was walking out to the cage, I was like, what the fuck is going on? Linz is on all the steroids in the world. Like, his physique has changed so much. Um, yet, Linz, um, in his last fight before the Prachnio one, you know, he was a bit um, chubby, um, looking a bit out of shape. And then with all the withdrawals, I was like, well, I'm fading this guy. He might even be coming in injured. And then he came to the cage, man, and his physique was just um, over the top. So, yeah, I do think Linz is on all the steroids in the world. I think OSP is at the end of his career. Um, and unfortunately, um, I hate to say it, but I think he's going to take a nap here in round one. You know, Linz is um, very proactive. You know, he goes for the kill where OSP, OSP doesn't. He's um, he's reactive. He's not active. He, he's happy to wait and counter people. Um, and I think he's going to do that back up to the cage and get sparked. I can't really push back on that. I mean, I think that neither one of these guys is super aggressive, but in this matchup, I just feel like with a speed advantage, that might give Linz the confidence to come forward and throw a little bit more. Um, you know, timing is everything in MMA. You know, you make this fight three years ago, maybe we're having a different conversation, but I think that um, 
like you mentioned, Philippe Lins, I think when he came to the UFC from PFL, probably got off the roids. He looked like shit. And then he was like, I'm getting right back on these. Uh, and I think USADA has been doing a little bit of that, 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 like just hands in their pocket, walking around whistling um, in the UFC lately because people are getting absolutely absurd physiques and nobody's getting caught for anything. So um, that's kind of cool. But anyways, <laughs> next up, we've got Jamal Ebers taking on Kusain Ashkabov and you know, based on the way that I, I kind of approach these fights, Jamal Ember scares me this weekend, um, you know, backing him because he's burnt people on a number of occasions, right? And now people are running to the window to back him again. But do I understand why? Yes. We've seen this archetype of, of fighter lose before. We've seen them be false favorites before. What I mean by that is like, you know, they got the, the name, everything looks good on paper, but then maybe they don't have the skills to back it up. And I think that the testing of this fighter, uh, Ashkabov, is probably not what you'd like to see. He's been in a very tough part of the world, but he's managed to fight, you know, a relatively easy strength of schedule despite that fact. And so normally that's something that would give you a little bit of those fraudulent vibes. You want to approach it with a degree of caution. Meanwhile, Jamal Emmers, he's fought a lot of UFC quality, you know, opponents. And that's what his major selling point is here. He has been expected to win all these fights. You know, like you look back, this is the first time you get him as an underdog in the UFC. Um, the guy is one and three as a UFC favorite, as a favorite in the Zufa organization. That's a problem for me. You know, that's the other problem for me is like, now you can get him at dog odds, but it's gotten shorter and shorter. If you were at plus 200, you know, if you're like uh, yourself, somebody that gets involved early, that's, uh, you know, an originator, right? That's sharp, uh, that's looking for sharp line movements. Uh, Pepe as well in the in the comments. There's there's people that wait for lines to drop. They see you, this is an incredible value opportunity. It's not going to last, and they take it. Makes perfect sense, right? I kind of let the market play out most of the time and, and sort of see where things are starting to end up. And so on a fight like this, it leaves me with my hands in my pockets. Where you know, unless Askabov moves to plus money, I'm not going to look to play him. He's a UFC debutant. A lot of unknowns on on his side. But am I going to look to play Jamal Embers at a short plus money when I could have had him at plus 200 earlier in the week? And now he's taking on the undefeated Russian guy with 3 million followers after, you know, they just had a Russian champion criticize their treatment of Russian fighters in the UFC publicly on huge platforms. It's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to get involved in that at all. Uh, if anything, I would be looking at the Ashkabov side here. I think that Jamal Embers is a very talented fighter. I just think that he makes mental mistakes in the cage that cost him dearly. Pat Sabatini was in all sorts of trouble. We've seen now that Pat Sabatini may have some chin issues, some durability issues. Hopefully not. Uh, he's an extremely talented fighter. His jiu-jitsu is incredible. But when you look at just the body of work recently, he's been getting hurt. He's been getting rocked. He's been getting touched on the feet. Some things of concern. He got dropped badly against Damon Jackson, not a known power uh, puncher. And then when you're looking at this kind of fight, Jamal Emmer's, had him in a lot of bad positions, but he just hung out in a leg lock scenario with a guy who's better at leg locks than him. And eventually he got caught. He was going for a toe hold, which by the way, I do all the time in jujitsu. It's a, it's a good counter. If you can go fast, be really aggressive and go hard. The other person will normally let go of your heel and be like, let's just go back to the feet. Like, because it's not really going to finish them most of the time, but it could, it could damage them. It could really hurt. It could, you know, mess up a ligament, whatever. And so you threaten it and then you normally get the response that you're looking for. If you guys want an example, go back and look at Gordon Ryan uh, versus Nicky Rod in the match that they had where Nicky Rod was very competitive. He went for a toehold right off the rip when Gordon went for his leg and he damaged Gordon's foot. So that's kind of the, one of the new meta answers to heel hooks is trying to get to another attack faster than they could get to a heel hook uh, as defense. And it's not easy, but Jamal Embers thought I'm going to do that. I think he was a Brown belt at the time. He might be a black belt now, but against Pat Sabatini, who's from an expert leg locking Academy, it was just a terrible idea. He got his knee ripped apart. So now he's coming back. He's coming off of injury. He's got way better experience. So I get why people took that early plus number, took the, the numbers all the way on down. But now it's at the point where I'm, I'm going to lay off this fight um, or look to back uh, the Russian if he flips uh, to the underdog here. Also, when these lines tend to flip, um, an observation over time uh, the library used to share was just that um, those fights tend to end inside the distance at a pretty high clip. You look at Jamal Emmers, 
he's a dangerous fighter, but he also makes critical errors that cost him, um, you know, finish losses at times. And I think that that's something to pay attention to here as well. Maybe not getting cute, looking for a fight doesn't go the distance here, uh, and hoping that these uh, boys get after it. Because I think Jamal Embers got a point to prove. Another guy who's a little bit older for the weight class and kind of needs to make his move now if he wants to move up. Uh, in the division, he's got that experience, but doesn't mean anything if you don't move forward with it. So I think this is a must-win fight for him. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, I like the Emma side here. Um, I like his strength of competition. I think it's way better than this Russians. You know, he went to a split with a uh, Giga. He beat um, Sandhagen in the day. He beat Alex Hernandez. Not that that means much. Um, but yeah, this Russian, he's coming um, back after two years off, and he is twenty-three and zero. But if you deep in if you dig into his record, the first 12 fights were against like 0 and 1 guys. Um, so I don't really count them. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a wrestling affair. I think Emma's is the better wrestler. Um, it's his debut, like you say. Um, and I agree what, with what you were saying about maybe it ends in the distance. You know, it's in the small cage. And I don't trust Emma's. You know, he, he has got some uh, red flags. You know, I used to get him mixed up with Tony Gravely a lot. Um, I, you know, they're very similar and uh, both of them are very prone to getting finished. Um, but yeah, I think at the number, like you were saying, whether it's plus two, 200, plus 150, um, I think if you got in early on the number, then you're on the right side. But um, obviously, um, it's a dog or pass situation. I don't know how you can trust this Russian. You don't really know what you're getting. Like I say, debut, time off, um, stay away. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting to note here, just from a market perspective, before we move off this fight, uh, a lot of fights have pretty tight market width. And what, what what we mean by that would be, you know, if it's priced plus 135 on one website, the best you're finding elsewhere is plus 145, and the worst you could find is plus 125. That's like a, a 20 cent market width. But this fight, it's all the way from uh, plus 115 uh, to plus 135, which the lower the number is, uh, the more significant that the change is. So um, it's a pretty interesting market with here. A uh, lot of different books, you know, all the way from plus 110 to plus 135, I'm seeing. Uh, so a 25 cent market with here. Um, and, you know, Bet365, one of the biggest outfits in the world, has done a plus 110 on Jamal Emmer's. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But then you're looking at some of the sharp houses, plus 134 on Bet Online. So, very different opinions here from uh, bookmakers that are taking a lot of action. So, interesting. Yeah, another thing that's interesting is this Russian, he had two fights already lined up. One was against Herbert Burns and one was against Joanderson Grito. Um, and I think both of them would have beat him. Um, I think they both would have finished him. Like, he is a, a wrestler predominantly, this uh, Russian. And I've seen him gas out in the third round. So, I think Burns would have probably found his submission. Um, and Brito probably would have been too strong. Um, and now he gets Jamal Emmers. Um, so take that for whatever it's worth. You know, what's funny, man, is I saw that and I thought the exact opposite to myself where I was like, I feel like the UFC is trying to set him up because Herbert Burns is kind of a fraud just in like, in terms of his ability to take damage at the UFC level, he could deal it out. He could knock people out. He's a dangerous guy, but we just seen when he faces like heavy resistance, he normally has a really hard time dealing with it. Um, just over the course of his career in ways that Gilbert wouldn't necessarily be accused of, especially in recent fights, went 15 hard minutes with Shemaev, for example. But yeah. I think that when you look at, you know, kind of what happened against, I think it was Algeo, right? Um, uh, or if, I, if I'm wrong, there's there's two, uh, Billy Q and Bill Algeo. I just confused their fights in my head, and I always will, I think, because um, they're two generic white guy 145ers, and I love them for it. Uh, also, they're just pace fighters. But anyways... Uh, when you look at this kind of fight, man, I think to myself, Jamal Emmers, does the UFC want to build a future with this guy? I mean, he's been in the UFC for a while. You know, I had a couple fights. He has no Instagram following. He's got no Twitter presence. He posts nothing. He does nothing to build these fights. So that's why for me, I feel like the UFC was looking for these guys where they're just like, who can we put against uh, this 23 and 0 guy where he's got a decent chance to win because then we can try and build him up as something and then give him the patty treatment, give him the whatever treatment and try and make a star out of him. Try and see if they've got something there. Um, whereas I don't think they're going to try and do that with Jamal. If he wins this fight, they're going to put him against some other killer until he loses. Right. It's like, that's, that's what they're going to probably do with Jamal. So I think best of luck to him, best of skill. He's a tough guy. He's a good fighter, but 
I don't think that the UFC is looking to, to position Jamal Embers as a, as a guy that they want to win. And you look at that Giga Chikadze fight. The one thing that really left me with an impression there is that Jamal Embers could have won that fight and he didn't. That's his own, that's his own damn fault. Like he, he had all the skills, all the tools, and he didn't go for the takedowns when he needed to. He was not opportunistic. And then in round three, he took over and he did it pretty easily and he got the takedowns. So it was just like, it was literally like a lapse of IQ. I think if he wrestles early and often in this fight, maybe it looks a little different, but really uh, concerning stuff for me on the rewatch. And I had a lot of tape uh, notes on that fight because I did a pretty in-depth study of Giga Chikadze. And that was one of the fights that made me think Giga Chikadze, a little bit fraudulent, like was getting audited by Jamal Embers in the third round. Um, you know, but I thought that that spoke to his lack of cardio um, in those exchanges. But either way, uh, do you have something more to add on this one? Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like we've already seen this fight play out. Um, the Russian fought a guy called Donovan Desme, um, who's fought in KSW, who I've watched a couple of times. And he's a grinder, a wrestler. And their fight was just that. Um, but the Ru Russian got the better of him. It was earlier in his career. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to play out pretty much like that did. Only I can see Emma's getting his hand raised. Um, so I don't know if people want to go back and watch that fight. Donovan Desme, um, I think that'll tell you a lot about how this fight's going to go down. Love it. I think I might sneeze. <laughs> Ooh, there it is. Um, also, uh, I'm just looking and seeing Emmers by sub is plus 1150. Kind of an interesting number just uh, inherently because he's probably going to be facing a ton of takedown attempts in this fight. And front headlock exchanges are one of the best ways to try and go for submissions. So I think that's a, an interesting look here. Uh, the KO for Emmers is plus 400 across the board. Kind of sneaky low as well. Interesting. Yeah, I don't mind that. Interesting. Uh, Ember's ITD is plus 300, uh, best available. So that's interesting as well. Uh, shout out to Uncle Wheezy in the comments says, in Ember's, you guys, uh, you have a guy coming off a knee surgery, year layoff, bad fight IQ, Kusain, 23-0 can crusher on a three-year layoff. I'm not getting near this fight. Hey, who could blame you for that? Uh, volatile fight here, Uncle Wheezy. Appreciate the shout. Uh, I agree with a lot of your points there as well. Next yeah. up. We got a fight at 155 pounds, uh, two of them in a row, as a matter of fact. But the first one is between names you might not know. Uh, Nazim Sadikov taking on Evan Elder. And I got to just own up. I made a terrible, terrible bet on Evan Elder uh, his last time out at pick -em odds against Preston Parsons because I was impressed with this tape uh, on the regional scene relative to what I had seen from Preston. And the truth was size was everything in that fight. Preston was huge. Uh, he imposed his will. He imposed his skill set on top. And I just felt like he had way more firepower on the feet. He was way bigger in every exchange. So he was able to easily move him around. It was just a tough fight for Evan Elder to win in the end. I um, think this is a much more competitive fight. Um, I don't know that Nazim is necessarily um, – oh, gosh. What happened here? Did I lose you for a second? No, you're good. Oh, all right. Don't know what just happened there. My computer froze up, so apologies, folks. Uh, either way, back at it. Nazim Sadikov out of uh, Law MMA, um, or I don't even know what they call it now, Sarah Longo. They changed the name 50 times, but um, it is basically the place where Ray Longo trains fighters. That's where he's from. Um, so Ray Longo is going to be in the corner here for Nazim Sadikov. Um, this should be an interesting fight. I mean, I think that Nazim has some power, uh, but I, I – I'm wasn't necessarily sold on him coming into contender series. I kind of thought that there was, um, you know, maybe some room for skepticism. Uh, I hadn't thought necessarily the highest level of competition on his way up either. Uh, but both of these guys are seven and one. So well-matched fight, pretty even here. Um, and you're seeing a minus 185 uh, or so on the Sadikov side, about a 65% favorite. Do you agree with the line? What do you think here, Rich? Um, yeah, I don't mind a dog shot at this opportunity. Um you know, Nazim, he's got his problems. He can be held on the cage. That's his biggest problem, biggest red flag. Um, strong in round one. Um, and like you said, on Dana White's contender series, it, he was just outsized in that one. Um, so, yeah, I think this is going to be a competitive fight. Um, I don't mind fight goes the distance. And I think this is going to be a, um, you know, a sleazy split decision to one of them. So, yeah, probably stay away or maybe take the dog shot. But I'm staying away. 
Yeah, that sounds about right to me uh, between these two guys. I think a lot of people are expecting this to end inside the distance, but I think they're like, you know, it could go either way, right? Because in, in the one hand, Evan Elder just took an absolute shit kicking from Preston Parsons, right? It was a brutal beat down that whole fight. However, he just took a brutal beat down up a weight class. And now we're expecting that this guy at 155 is going to just put his lights out. That seems like a little bit of a reach here. Um, I think the kid's really tough. He's not going to quit on you. So you're going to have to put him to sleep. Um, and I think that that's possible. Uh, shout out to Glenbot. He says Nazim round three, 14 to one. But I really don't think that Evan Elder – uh, is going away easy in this fight. And I actually think he might have the better cardio here. So uh, it should be an interesting fight. No action for me yet. But if this creeps up over two to one on the elder side, I'm going to have to get involved on principle. If I thought I should bet him, you know, minus 110 up at 170, I'm not going to let any, you know, uh, noise or anything like that try and steer me off that uh, in this kind of fight at 155. Yeah. That's another I guy, same experience. I agree, man. I think it is risky. And I can imagine the Nazim in the distance line being something like minus 110. Um, and I think people are going to get burnt on it, man. They're going to try and half the uh, money line um, and take a shot in the distance. And uh, yeah, I'd be wary of it, man. And if anything, I think he finishes in round one. You know, he's um, notoriously finished in round one. He's strong in round one. Um, and then he kind of like dives off a little bit. So yeah, risky yeah, fight. I'm seeing right now... Uh... They've taken some action on Sadikov by knockout, but sharp markets aren't bringing it down uh, just yet. Sadikov by sub also got hit down on DraftKings. Uh, they opened up a plus 750. It's down to plus 700, but you're still seeing 10 to 1 out there uh, on Sadikov by sub as well uh, at Bet Rivers and a couple other houses. So interesting, interesting stuff here. Again, I like to look for those market disparities a little bit in the prop market and see um, if books are taking opinions. So interesting to see uh, they can't really come to a consensus on on the most likely method inside the distance for Sadikov. And for me, that that's normally a sign of weakness on the inside the distance. Similarly, the inside the distance here, you were expecting minus 110. It's probably going to close around that uh, if I know the MMA market like I think I do. But I also, I'm seeing plus 165 right now. Yeah, that's um, crazy. So I've seen that, yeah. I think that'll, that'll probably come down by the time that the fight rolls around. Um, especially if the Sadikov side continues to take love. Uh, Sadikov open in this fight. Um, of course, best fight odds is stumbling on the job. It always does. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can get it on the refresh. Sadikov opened minus 260 and is now at a minus 195. I'm surprised by that. Uh, didn't expect to see him open at that price, but it makes sense because they're adjusting to the Evan Elder money that came in. Um, I saw yesterday, I don't know if this is still reflected by the public splits, but um, there was a sharp distribution on Evan Elder. Uh, looks like the books will need Sadikov uh, at the current distribution. But that being said, um, it was about 33% of the tickets and 70% of the money uh, yesterday on the Evan Elder side. So suggesting that the people uh, who are heavily invested are doing so with the underdog here, moving that number from a minus 260 uh, to a minus 195, a lot more attractive for betters as well. And I think that's a pretty critical threshold crossing over the uh, minus 200 to minus 190 type of threshold. Normally they don't like to move that if they think the fighter's going to win. So um, just something to bear in mind. Uh, it could be a trap line. Anyways, next up, speaking of could be a trap line, I mean, geez Louise, minus 600 uh, right now on Bet Online for Myra Buena Silva. Um, listen, I like Myra Buena Silva. I bet her a couple times. I, I think I bet her by sub the night that she got that uh, phantom submission. So I, I, I'm not above anything, you know, and she actually does have a pretty slick arm bar transition, I will say. But I think that this is kind of a weird fight for me. Um, on the one hand, I don't really like betting on older fighters uh, as a rule, unless there's a really uh, solid reason to do so just because of the long-term win rate, the return on investment from the company standpoint. It's just like, there's a bunch of things that don't add up uh, for older fighters at times where whether you like it, love it, hate it, it just is a reality. The, the business is trying to move on. And so they're trying to put out younger killers to, to get them out um, most of the time. This is not necessarily that example. You know, um, I think they, maybe they're trying to set up Myra Buena Silva for a finish, but like, is that is that something that, um, has been, you know, vindicated by the recent performances from the Landsberg side. Not really. Um, she's been pretty tough. She's been pretty competitive in a lot of these fights, um, even against really terrible matchups like Sarah McMahon. I mean, people want to knock that, um, 
you know, kind of fight. Sarah McMahon has very clear, obvious flaws, but seeing her fight in person, she's just an extremely physical woman. So that's just a terrible matchup for her. Sarah McMahon at any age of her life is going to be extremely physical. Um, you know, she's got great musculature. So I think that for Lena Landsberg, this is a much more physically well-matched fight for her. I think she'll be able to move around with Myra in the clinch. I don't think she's going to get bodied here. I don't think Myra is the most reliable takedown threat. I don't think she's going to be super consistent. So for me, it's going to be a very greasy fight that could play out on the feet. Um, could end up going to a decision here. And uh, I think that maybe, maybe it's ends up close on volume as well. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of clinch striking. So yeah, um, Probably a dogger pass for me. Haven't bet on the fight, but plus 400. I mean, they're they're begging me, and I might have to answer. What do you think, Rich? Uh, I've got one unit on Landsberg plus 375. Um, yeah, someone tell me why Myra is at fucking 135. Um, it just makes no sense to me. You know, she lost that fight to Marion Firot however you say her name, at 125. Mono <laughs> Yeah, so she, she she goes up her weight to 135. Um, she fights the um, Asian girl, Wu. Um, and I had money on that fight. I bet um, Myra, I bet her by submission. And I was severely disappointed. I learned big lessons in that one. You know, she almost even lost the fight by decision. Never mind, she didn't get the fucking sub. Um I don't like her at all. You know, then like you say, she gets the phantom armbar on Edgar. I think she's terrible, Silva, and I don't know why the hell she's minus 500 here. She doesn't offensively wrestle. Uh, you know, the only time she hits these armbars is when girls take her down. That's not Landsberg's game at all. Landsberg makes it dirty. She pushes you against the cage. She's happy and content there for 15 minutes. Um, Silva can't strike. She thinks she can, but she can't. Um, she throws low volume. She's just terrible. I can really see an upset here. As long as, for whatever reason, Silva doesn't come out like a D1 wrestler and put Landsberg on her, her back. But all the fights she's ever had, she never does that. So I don't think she's going to do it. Um, yeah, I, I, you got to play the dog here, man. And it's definitely worth a shot. She's all the way up to plus 400 now. Um, Silva's clinch striking is great. Don't know about that. Um, so, yeah, I'm taking Landsberg, man. Yeah, I think that it's going to be a very competitive fight either way. I think both these women are are fairly tough, but I just don't I don't see this as a massive massive skill gap. I don't see it as a massive physicality gap, so can't really justify the huge price here for me. Uh, just for the folks at home that may not uh, you know convert these things into uh, percentages, eighty five point seven one percent implied win probability for Myra Buena Silva in a UFC fight. It's pretty aggressive, man. Um, you know, most of the time I say 15% is like, if the person's like stinks, but they have some power, 15% is like the, the base. Like you can't really get much lower than that in an MMA fight. You know, pe we've seen people throw one kick blow out their knee. It's like, you're doing offense to people with your body. You could easily get hurt. And outside of that, um, you know, people just make stupid mistakes. People get caught in chokes that they never should have got caught in. You know, people make one mistake in a fight that they're winning otherwise and lose. So for me, it's just pretty hard to get to 85% in volatile WMMA. What do you yeah. Think? And also um, post having a baby uh, Landsberg, when she come back, I know she's lost to two fights since then, but they were her warm up fights, man. I think she's, you know, back in the groove of things now. And um, yeah, she's, um, she's a tough bitch, man. So um, Silva's got a hands full. Straight up. With that being said, guys, we can move along to the next fight here. We've got Jim. A10 Miller taking on Alexander Hernandez. According to Tapology, I'm just refreshing this. It says prelim here. I'd have to assume this is the fifth fight on the main card. Um, I think we're just dealing with 11 fights this weekend. That's correct. So yeah, 11 fights here. This is going to be the fifth fight. I assume it's going to be on the uh, on the main card. And yeah, I think uh, Mills, you might be surprised when we get to the uh, main event breakdown. We haven't got there yet, but. Uh, right now, uh, talking about Jim A. Ten Miller and Alexander Hernandez. Whoa, um, I don't know exactly what to say here, but I'll say this: um, first and foremost, Alexander Hernandez, pretty hard to trust at the price. Right? Again, we talk about what what we're doing here. We're not just betting on fighters; we're betting on prices. And Alexander Hernandez at evens in this fight. I mean, you'd have to take that, right? He's the much younger guy. He throws huge power shots on the feet. 
Uh, he's got a decent enough submission craft of his own. He's not completely lost on the ground. He's got seven minutes of work. Jim Miller doesn't have much more than that in him these days. Um, so all those things you'd say, yeah, give it to the younger guy here. But we're not talking about minus 110. And we're not talking about minus 150. We're talking about minus 250 on a guy that just finds a way to lose UFC fights over and over and over again against a guy who can't help but find a way to win UFC fights, um, even fights he's not supposed to. But you look back over, over history, I do like to look at people's performance and their odds range. I don't share all this information all the time, but somebody asked me here, um, they said, you know, what do you think, Liam? What, what's the breakdown for, for Jim Miller? And I was a little bit surprised because Jim Miller, if you backed him as a favorite, you've been making money. You've been making a lot of money, as a matter of fact. Jim Miller delivers when he's a favorite. He's been costing you a little bit of money if you've been betting on him as an underdog, right? <laughs> Jim, Jimmy's not always coming through when he's the plus 190. You know, he's not always doing that for you, but he's done it before. He has come through as an underdog. And more importantly, Alexander Hernandez has dropped the ball as a favorite. He's the kind of guy who's ballooning around in weight, doesn't know what weight class he is, doesn't know what kind of fighter he is, doesn't know if he wants to do this for a career anymore, right? Always talks about, do I want to retire? Do I want to do this? Am I going here? Should I do this weight class? Doesn't seem like a guy who's got it all figured out to me. Jim Miller knows exactly what he wants to do. He wants to fight till UFC 300. He wants to survive till then. So I think this is going to be a pretty high-paced fight. I think Jim Miller is going to come out and try and impose his will on this kid. I don't think that Jim Miller knockout is out of the question. I think that he throws with real power and real intention. But I think more often than not, he's going to have to submit this guy. Uh, he's a young kid. Uh, when you see guys like Alexander Hernandez, I don't think that the way to get to them most often is to beat him up on the feet. Uh, because he's very live there. He's a spark plug. He's got a lot of power, especially now he's not cutting that much weight. He might have a little bit more energy to do it for, you know, eight, 10 minutes now, but he also overspends himself. Like you mentioned with Alonzo Menafield, sometimes you see a guy kind of run out of ideas and it seems like Alexander Hernandez is one of those guys. He kind of runs out of ideas midway through the fight, stops knowing what to do next and starts to be a lot more predictable. He's going to come in with a jab. He's going to come in with a basic combo, but he doesn't have much conviction behind what he's doing. You look, though, at the strength of schedule, it's been pretty tough. That's the other thing. Alexander Hernandez has fought a pretty a pretty tough strength of schedule in the UFC. Um, so I want to give him that little benefit of the doubt. But I thought his last fight was a little bit of writing on the wall. I don't think he's long for this sport. I don't think he's long for the UFC. Um, so I think Jim Miller is going to get it done in shocking fashion once again. Uh, he seems like a public dog this week. That's my only concern. I'm hoping the Alexander uh, love comes in big time when he takes his shirt off at the weigh-ins and he looks great. Uh, against Jim, who's going to look like an average guy in his mid to late thirties, but Lyme disease, Miller, Northeast, beast coast, stand up, baby. We're coming. Cool. I think Jersey's strong in the building. Jim Miller's going to get it done. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, I think it's crazy. Anyone betting Hernandez in this, um, situation, you know, like you said, with the market at like minus 200 or more, um, and you were saying like the dogs getting a lot of love this week. Most of the people I know are on bloody Hernandez and I've been asking them like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, and they all say like, he's younger, he's athletic and the rest of it. And Jim's old. Um, but he's been old for like the last three, four fights and he's still getting it done. Um, like you say, Hernandez is a mental midget. He breaks in there halfway through the first round. Um, he, let's have a go and look at his record, man. So yeah, he obviously got the uh, KO on Benny. He beat Trinaldo, but he didn't beat Trinaldo. That was bullshit. Um, lost to Drew Dober. Yeah, that was this. a fraudulent decision, dude. That's a bad one, man. Um, he's best. Tiago win. Moises beat his ass. That was one of my best bets ever. Plus one ninety nine, one and a half units. Everybody was saying uh, Alexander Hernandez is going to clean him up because Tiago can't get takedowns, and he boxed him up for fifteen full minutes because Tiago Moises doesn't have great power, but he boxed his ass up. That Benny Benny KO um, was the biggest bloody fluke in MMA history, man. Um, after that, what's he got? Chris Gritzmacher, Mike Breeden. Like, what the fuck? Um, I, anyway, get back to this fight. I think he's going to try and wrestle because um, he's an idiot. And I think he's going to get caught in a guillotine or an armbar transition on the ground. You know, he is a, a half decent wrestler, but he just makes stupid mistakes. And I, I don't think he can do that for three rounds solid. I know he did it on OAM, but OAM doesn't have the jiu-jitsu that Jim Miller does. Um, so I hope Alex tries to take him down um, and get subbed. I don't think Alex can KO Jim. I don't think that's live at all. Um, I think Jim's been like, what, KO'd once in his whole career against uh, Dan Hooker. Um, so, yeah, I, 
you can't be betting Hernandez, man. It's uh, Jim ITD, or take a shot on the sub, in my opinion. I feel like Jim Miller got finished by knockout one other time. Um, no. Yeah, he's been knocked out twice, and it was Clay fucking Guido, was it not? Um, or somebody fucking retarded. What was that knockout loss that he had? I got to go back yes. and find it now. Cerrone, um, head kick. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Clay Guido. Oh, you dude, I, I, tried to, I tried to give Clay one there. I tried to give Clay one there. I couldn't. I couldn't. You can't hate it, though. That was when, um, that was, you know, prime Donald Cerrone. That was Cerrone. title challenger Cerrone. And if you fought Donald Cerrone and it was not in a main event, you were fucked. Because yeah. Donald, when he doesn't have pressure on, he's a good fighter. But you put a little pressure on Donald Cerrone and it's one body kick and the, the fight is over. Those were the days, man. Cerrone versus Nate Diaz when Nate was giving him the double fingers in between rounds. That those amazing fights. Oh, that yeah, that was another time because again, it was a huge fight. It was really meaningful. Those fights, I always felt like Donald really struggled with. But uh, he's a he's a fun fighter, man. Uh, y'all y'all that are new to the UFC, do your Donald Cerrone homework. Cool. Uh, a lot of fun finishes for and again. So uh, go back and watch those. But anyways, we got William Knight taking on Marcin Pracnio. Up next, just want to say real quick, guys, if you haven't already, go ahead and follow my man, Just Win Baby, uh, on social media. You can find him at Just with two T's, Win Baby. Uh, also, guys, follow me at Liam Picks Fights. Go ahead and like this video if you haven't already. Get subscribed to the channel because we're doing it each and every week for you live, breaking down the fights and trying to give you that betting perspective as well. That being said, William Knight, Marcin Pracnio. Uh, want to shout out my guy, uh, Anthony Malgudi, made. William Knight say no mas uh, when they were having a grappling match. Uh, old old friend from Henzo Gracie of Warwick. So I've seen some real uh, skeptical notes on the William Knight side. Granted, Anthony Malgudi is an absolute stud athlete. He is an absolutely talented jiu-jitsu player. But he is relatively inexperienced relative to somebody like Knight, who's been a professional fighter for some time now, who's been around the game. And he was having a very tough match, and he wanted out of that match respectfully. Uh, and got out of that match. So I think it ended up being called a draw, whatever. I think he might have been bleeding from the mouth a little bit, but he did not like the pressure game that was being brought to bear there. Um, I think that for Marcin Pracnow, he's not really a huge pressure wrestler or something like that, right? He's going to be looking to land the big body kick from the outside. That's how he put down Ike Villanueva in the fight where he looked good. But I think he's a little bit skeptical, man. I think that his chin is fugazi. Uh, I think that William Knight, the problem for me is same thing is true right? Like he's gotten clipped and caught when I wasn't expecting it before. Um, I don't think that he is a lockdown wrestler and grappler. We saw Daun Jung really struggle in the wrestling and grappling in his last fight. He made it look like, you know, he was a, a wrestling national champion against William Knight. Just took him down every time he wanted to. Got to the, literally, this is the thing that was so frustrating. It wasn't that he got taken down. It's that he got taken down, Rich, with the same exact move over and over and over again. The same over under stepping outside trip, which I've been hitting since high school. It's like, you got to learn the defense to that one. You got to come out after the second round and not get hit with it again. Terrible, terrible thing um, to see for me. So with all that being said, uh, I don't have any interest in betting on this fight, except maybe that it will end inside the distance. Um, it's probably a disgusting number because both these guys are bad. Uh, and I think that there's a chance that they could kind of grease this way too to a decision uh, because they're sloppy, light heavyweight type brawlers. But I don't know, man. I think they both have skeptical chins. I think they're both going to swing for the fences. I think they're both going to spend most of the fight at distance. So if that's the case, I think somebody's getting knocked out. Uh, what do you think about this one? It's funny you say that. If I had to make a bet, I'd bet um, Pratchneo decision um, plus 400 range. Um, but I'm not, and I've got no interest in this fight, and I didn't look into it too deep. Um, so I've, I've literally got nothing to say and no interest. I don't even want to look into it. I love it. Honestly, that is the best thing that we can do for this fight is move on to the next fight. Uh, so shout out to everybody in the comments. Got a lot of sharp people rocking with us. Um, wanted to say, uh, has Jim Miller ever won a decision? Uh, that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked 10 and 11 in fights that go to decision. So Jim Miller, that's where he's coming up short. When fights go to the scorecards, but Hernandez, he's kind of a guy that welcomes that volatility, welcomes that killer be kill kind of style. So I don't think that he's going to go to decision with Jim Miller. Uh, I don't think it's going to be like the Joe Gracie fight. I think it's going to be a lot more like a car crash where somebody comes out the better end of this. And it might be Alexander Hernandez. Uh, WW says, is it possible Hernandez starts with Miller? I mean, obviously he's a young kid with a lot of power and Jim Miller 
is getting older. He's there to be hit. He's had a ton of fights. But Jim Miller is also no slouch. Like, he fights every day. He's been fighting every day for, like, 20 years. So not an easy guy to catch, not an easy guy to put away. And uh, I think he's going to bring the fire here. I like Jim Miller. Uh, yeah, to make to make that fight simple, I think it's Jim in the distance, or I do think it's Alex by decision. I don't think Alex is knocking him out, and he definitely ain't subbing him. Wow, interesting, interesting, interesting. They got plus three seventy on the fight to end by sub, which I kind of thought was interesting. Uh, that sharp markets are pricing Jim Miller by sub at like plus four hundred. I um, made one one bet on the fight, and it was uh, Jim by sub at four twenty five. I think. Um, so yeah, hmm. half a unit, and I'm done. Yep, I don't mind that at all. I'm seeing plus 500s out there. I think that's a good number as well. Um, next up, guys, Josh Parisian, Jamal Pogues. Um, this is a, uh, a fight where it's probably favored or pass for me, right? I, I think that Josh Parisian is not very good uh, for UFC-level fighting. That's just my, my truthful opinion. I don't want to come here and, and lie to you guys. I think that he's got a lot of heart. I think he's a tough guy. I think he showed in his last fight he could deal with some adversity and come back. Uh, so you got to really put him away. He's not just going to quit uh, if the going gets a little tough. But I also think that Alain Mado isn't really elite resistance, right? And like, most of the time, unless your name's Parker Porter, he's looking to check out inside the distance if stuff's not going well. So for me, I have kind of skeptical hippo eyes about the Josh Parisian uh, upside prospects here. Um, I'll appreciate that library. Shout out. Um, and uh, so for me, when I look at this fight, man, Josh Parisian, I describe these fighters sometimes, and I try and do it respectfully as a big glass of milk. Like the guy is just not very athletic looking. You'd never look at him and say, what a, what a premier athlete I should invest in him. Jamal, on the other hand, he has some losses, right? He shows losses, but then you look at who they're to, you know, they're mostly, they're pretty reasonably talented fighters. Uh, Alex Polizzi um, was his most recent loss. Alex is not a bad fighter uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. And he lost by fourth round um, uh, sub in that fight. I think it was a heel hook. If Josh Parisian heel hooks, this guy, I'll just come out here and eat my shorts. Uh, I will. So I think that uh, for me, what was kind of interesting about this fight is the Pogues by subline. Um, it's getting hit down a little bit, but there's some places that are offering eight to one uh, on Pogues by sub here. Uh, Parisian was Camorid in 2019 by a guy who has two professional wins by sub that I've never heard of. So I don't think that he is an elite defensive ground player. I think we saw that in his recent fights in the UFC as well. He's been dominated by strikes on the ground. Uh, he's been a punching bag on the ground for strikes as well before. And I think that that opens people up to getting submitted. Um, Pogues, when you fight at 205, you have to have some athleticism, right? Like at heavyweight, there is a very low bar more often than not to entry. If you have some power, if you can show up to the gym four times a week, like if you can do some reasonable things, you could be a heavyweight and make it as a pro. But it's a lot harder, in my opinion, to do that at light heavyweight, then middleweight, then welterweight, because there's just more people that are that size that aren't in other athletic disciplines, getting paid lots of money to be in the NFL, getting paid lots of money to be in the NBA. There's other avenues of professional sport, whereas most small people, this is their, this is your ticket to the big time. So it's like, I think that's why we see much higher global participatory rates at those lower weight classes and a lot more competition and a lot better fighters. You can get a lower bar to entry in these upper weights. Jamal, from a lower weight, moving up, I think he's going to have a lot of damage he could do. Think about Jamal Hill. Doesn't cut all the much weight, right? Looks kind of like he's got a little bit of chub on him, right? Respectfully. But he is able to compete with these guys because he has actual skills. Like he actually learned some techniques. And that will set you apart in these divisions. And I think that for Jamal, he's going to have the technique advantage if this goes to the ground. Um, I think he's going to take it there at some point. He's kind of a risk averse fighter. I thought we saw that in his last fight. Didn't go out there and go crazy, but I think he's going to have opportunities to finish here. He's going to get on top of a guy he's better than. I think he's going to have more cardio. I think he's going to outlast him. I think he's going to finish him on the ground. Uh, what do you think about this one, Rich? Yeah, I dug deep on this one, to be honest. I didn't know much about um, Jamal, but um, yeah, I went and looked at his record, see what he's about. And I was surprised to see he was a wrestler, um, especially at that weight because he certainly doesn't look like one. And that's why he's lost the fights that he has against Palizzi, Jordan Young, um, Taylor Johnson, because they're great wrestlers too. Um, and they're really good ones, especially like Taylor Johnson um, and Palizzi, even though Palizzi is a bit undersized. 
Yeah, the and, late Jordan Young, by the way, rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, good dude. I actually talked to him in the DMs before. Uh, sweetheart of a guy. So tragic story there, but um, talented fighter. Uh, people forget he knocked out Amari Akhmedov in his last fight um, yeah. in in PFL. Impressive stuff. So I just wanted to give him that shout. Yeah, good jujitsu too, man. Um, so, solid guy. Um, so yeah, Pogues. He didn't um, wrestle in his Dana White's Contender Series. Um, I did see an interview where he said that his opponent showed a good sprawl early on. Um, so he felt like he had good anti-wrestling and he just felt like keeping it on the feet. So I do think he's going to use a bit of IQ in this fight. And I do think he's going to take down Josh Parisian, um, which is his kryptonite. If you go and watch Josh's fights, um, Dante Mays laid the blueprint. You know, take this fucker down. Uh, midway through round two, the guy's done. Um, start a round three is 100% done. Um, like he was in the Parker Porter fight, they come out round three. Josh is done. You know, Porter's took him down a couple of times, round one and two. And he doesn't wrestle. He stands on the feet. He's literally Josh. He's, he's got, he's on one lung, man. He's fucked. All it needs is one takedown and he's getting finished. And, um, you know, Parker Porter was an idiot. Um, it's like malarkey last week, you know, you come out round one, you take the guy down, that's the path of least resistance. Then you come out in two and three and you don't get your takedowns. Crazy to me. Um, but yeah, I like the subline for Pogues. you got to take a shot at that, plus 800, plus 900. I think he's going to get a finish. Um, you can even get fight. doesn't go the distance at like minus 110 to cover a, um, a Josh KO. Um, so yeah, I really like po Pogues this week. Um, I think he's going to shine, man. And I liked his interview as well, um, if you didn't all catch that. Um, with MMA Junkie, his interview was pretty cool, man. I liked what he was saying. Confident guy. Yeah, and guys, um, I bet Alain Badeau for real U.S. dollars against <laughs> Josh Parisian. So if you need to know my opinion of Josh Parisian as an MMA fighter, it's not very high. Uh, I think that he is, he is not long for the UFC, um, but he's a guy that's willing to take a beating and take hard fights and get beat up by Dante Mazes of the world. And I remember when people were convinced that Dante Mays – future world champion because of that performance. Uh, and then what was the follow-up to that fight uh, for Dante Mays? Um, the Hamdi Abdel Wahab absolute travesty fight where he got easily out-wrestled the whole time by a guy who looked like he was having a cardio death and who's now suspended by USADA, I believe. So uh, yeah, that fight's so been overturned to a no contest. <laughs> but, man, you know that the UFC is on. Oh, yo, shout out to Kappa Betts. You just caught my eye with that. Tafa gang. Lovely KO. I got to say, Parker Porter is like a good guy. Like that guy. Followed me on social media. Shout out, Parker Porter. But it's betting, man. There's no friends in this business. <laughs> at, a, at a certain point, it's just about dollars and cents. And you get uh, Tafa under two and a half rounds plus 200. It's a heavyweight fight. The guy's favored to win. Plus 200 on the under two and a half. Okay. All right. I'll take that every time and, and live to be wrong on some of them. But um, you know, plus 440 to win by knockout in round one and another just complete misprice uh, of the fight. But yeah, what I meant to say was uh, we're on dire straits, guys. The co-main event here is Zach Pauga and Jordan Wright. Um, Jordan is the wrong man for the job in the co-main event more often than not. Oh, um, and he's basically been brought in by the UFC to lose just like as a career arc. Um, he is a fun fighter. Brings that killer be killed kind of style. But just you look at who they fed him to, a lot of guys that could beat him. And he lost in vicious fashion most of the time. You think of Fluffy Hernandez and you think a guy who's going to put a pace on you. He's going to outgrapple you. He's going to really make you work on the ground. He's going to force you into these positions. You know, he's going to. And then all of a sudden, he knocks him out with like the first punch of the fight. It's like, whoa, this guy might be really bad. Then you see in subsequent fights, Guys, he's not good. Uh, he's just not a very good, effective MMA fighter, uh, Jordan Wright. I think he has some ancillary skills, but they last about four and a half minutes. I don't think he likes getting hit. I don't think he takes damage very well. I think he's too easy to hit, so he wears damage poorly. Uh, he's going to need to come out and wrestle in this fight, in my humble opinion, uh, and get the fight to the ground because I think he's a chin liability. I don't think that Pauga is something special. I faded him in his last fight. I told people, you're really going to bet against – uh, Kamaru Usman's brother against some randos 34. Like, I don't know about all this. However, you know, in this fight, I, I kind of get it. I understand why he's uh, favored to win the fight. Um, I think that they want to do him a favor. Like, yo, sorry, we have to get you knocked out by that big athletic guy. Let's get you back in there against somebody a little bit more manageable that you could beat. 
because they've invested all the marketing dollars on this effing show, putting this guy in a position where they built him up for this show and then he gets knocked out in the second round and they're like, all right, now we got our hands in our pockets. Don't know what to do with you. Let's get you in there with somebody you can beat and see if we have anything with you. If not, let's get you knocked out again and we'll give you your, your papers and we'll be done with you. So I feel like that's what this fight is. It's a loser leave town. Uh, somebody's fighting for their job here. I think they're going to knuckle each other up. I think that the one thing that's interesting is the total. The total, I think, was at under one and a half. Let me see what it's at right now. Under one and a half is getting steamed, okay? It opened plus 115. It is all the way down uh, with probably 100% of the betting action, I'd have to assume, because it's a Jordan Wright fight. It's all the way down to minus 175 on sharp markets, minus 200, some of the square books. Guys, I'll tell you this. Zach Pauga is not a first-round knockout artist by trade. That's really not what he's been doing. Um, and so this might turn into Zach Pauga gets taken down in round one, and then he ends up knocking him out, you know, three minutes into round two, and then everybody's crying in their coffee about this effing under uh, because that's what it screams to me, man. When it opens plus 115 or on a Jordan fucking right fight, what do you think? They're not paying attention? The guy's gone under in every fucking UFC fight he's had except one, I think. So it's like – they know that this guy's an under machine, but they know the other guy's not, and he's the big favorite. They expect him to win, so they think the other guy might win round one. Then maybe they have to deal out, you know, minus one twenty uh, a piece in between rounds for the money line, and then Pauga smokes him in the second round, and then they get all the money that they wanted on the fight. So for me, uh, why is this fight in a co-main event? Is it to build up Jordan Wright? Is it because they love the Beverly Hills Ninja? Hasn't seemed like that to me his whole career. So I think it's it's a pretty obvious spot where they're trying to set this guy up to knock him out. And I think he's going to. So Pauga by knockout, probably round two or three. Scoop the public. I like it. What do you think? Yeah, I like what you're saying on the over-unders there. Um, I think you're crazy to take any action. Um, even betting the under, like you said. Pauga's the side and he doesn't um, notoriously finish um, fights in round one. And um, yeah, you're just sweating too much betting that um, betting that over. So I'd stay away. Um, he's at elevation. Um, Zach is, you know, he's working with Curtis Blades. I think he's going to have superior cardio. I think he's going to have like a Curtis Blades approach to this fight. Um, so yeah, I really like. I think a good way to um, tackle this fight would be to bet Zach by finish in round two and to finish in round free and uh, maybe put half a unit on both and you come out in profit um let's look at the odds i think it was like plus 400 um for zach to finish in round two uh let's have a look, let's have a look. wow zach in round three is plus 1400 on FanDuel. that's fucking absurd yeah and he's 600 in round two so you know put half a unit on both of them and uh you're coming out with profit man you know what's wild, man? In New York, um, like jurisdictions in the states all have their own different little rules. And one of the rules is you can tie the method market to the uh, to the round, but you okay. can't have a round independent. And they have it on other sports books, but FanDuel, for whatever reason, if you go to Jersey, you can get access to the rounds. You can get access to everything that you see on Best Fight Odds. But when you go from New York, you can't get access to all those uh, and some of them come out later in the week. It's it's finicky okay. stuff, man. I, I only know this because I used to bet in Jersey before I ever bet in New York, before it was legal to bet in New York. I'd drive across the border. And then I was like, what the hell? They just opened up Vandal in New York, and now there's half the stuff on it. So um, it's just one thing to keep in mind. I'm going to have to uh, consider you know, maybe taking a little 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 trip across the border here uh, to get down because that, that seems like a pretty wild number to me. Um, now, the, the only thing I'm a little bit concerned about is just – Jordan Wright, um, he, he might have some submission equity in the early going here. I don't expect it because Pauga trains with a better team. Uh, but just Jordan Wright, he does have that kind of explosive game where he can stun people and then hop on their back, get a finish kind of deal. Um, and I'm looking at him by sub priced at about plus 1100. So if I was to play any right props, that's probably what I would look at here. I think everybody will be on right by knockout if they play him at all uh, because Pauga got knocked out in his last fight. I think that's a possibility, but for me, Jordan Wright uh, is probably going to club and sub if anything. So um, for me, that would be the way to play the dog here. Um, I I do not think there's enough juice for the squeeze here at plus two thirty personally. But I wish you guys the best uh, if you get involved on either side. I think Palga is probably the side here um, from the UFC standpoint. 
So with that being said, guys, what you've been asking for, what you've been blowing up in the comments, uh, I just want to say, drop your favorite bets below this in the comments section and next to it, leave what you think the name of this show should be. We're still looking for a name. Uh, we've been doing the show now for a couple of weeks and everybody seems to enjoy uh, the rapport. We've got pretty good information for you guys here, but do us that favor. Drop in the comment section below your favorite bet of the day and who, uh, you know, what you think we should name this stuff going forward. Uh, so we have a better name for it, um, for you guys. But that being said, guys, main event breakdown. Here we are live to discuss Aaron Blanchfield taking on Jessica Andrade. I know that my man, Rich has a strong opinion here. So without further ado, I'll cue him up. What do you got, Rich? Yeah. So I, I, don't like giving my uh, bets away, obviously. Obviously, I do a Patreon. Um, but this week, I thought, fuck it. You know, everyone's chatting a lot of shit about Andrade. They're putting out all these false narratives. So I had to, like, clap back and let them know, um, you know, where I thought they were going wrong. Um, so, yeah, I've ended up max betting Erin. I got something stupid on her, like nine units. I've got her by KO. Um, and I've got her in the distance. Um, yeah, I really like Erin here. And I'll tell you why. You know... One of the main narratives that people are chatting this week are, oh, she couldn't take down um, Aldrich in her last fight. You know, she was getting pieced up by Aldrich in the first round, um, which is just complete bullshit. Um, she didn't get takedowns on Aldrich. We all know that. We've all watched the fight. But um, she wasn't getting pieced up at all. I think people were just listening to the commentary, which was biased. If you go and look at the stats, Erin outlanded her 21 strikes to 16 in the first round. Aaron was 11 for 11 on her body kicks um, and knees. You know, she was landing them knees multiple times in round one, and they were, um, you know, having an effect on Aldrich. Comes to round two, and what does she do? She knees her in the stomach, and that's what led to the submission. You know, Aldrich felt that, and um, that's what ultimately led to, like, her demise and Aaron getting the finish. And, you know, so what if she didn't get a takedown on uh, Aldrich in round one, it's like, you know, they're fresh, you know, it's fucking a girl fight, man. Uh, Aldrich is 5'7", she's from a half-decent camp, she rolls with the likes of Rose Namajunas, you know, say what you want about Rose, but, you know, she's fucking good, man, she's technical. Um, so, yeah, I don't put too much stock into that, and that doesn't translate to me, like, oh, she couldn't take Aldrich down, she's definitely not going to be able to take somebody, like, Andrade down, you know, someone with her calibre. Um, so yeah, a lot of noise this week that I didn't like um, about um, Andrade and how good she was going to be. I got in on this early. I think I bet Monday. Um, you know, I was I was happy with the take that I did. Um, it seems like a lot of people are now on Erin. You know, the line has moved drastically. I think it opened plus one sixty five, something like that. Um, uh, what else have I got? Yeah. So in terms of this fight, how I think it's going to go. Um, Blanchfield versus Andrade. I think she's going to KO her. I think she's going to land a head kick on her. You know, she knocked out um, Victoria Leonardo back in the day. She dropped her in the first round, and then she finished her with a head kick later on, KO'd her. Um, she was throwing this high kick on Aldrich. You know, she was almost landed it. She threw it multiple times. And I think she's going to throw it up again. Um, she's only 5-1 Andrade. Um, I think she's going to, you know, be able to hit it easier. And for all the, you know, striking prowess and uh, love that Andrade gets, you know, for her striking, I don't even think she's that technical, man. She reminds me of someone like John Lineker. You know, she's got power in her hands, but she swings wild. You know, these four or five punch combinations. She likes to throw low kicks um, to get people concentrating on the low kicks. And then she will burst with these four or five punch combinations. Go watch the Murphy fight. It was very evident there. And that's when Aaron can level change and get the takedowns. Um, Andrade's just takedown defense is shit. Um, it's so overrated. Murphy was having success. She's just really old, unathletic, and slow. So she wasn't able to, you know, really implement that game and hold her down. Erin will. Um, Erin's the future, man. 23. Andrade's coming in on short notice. She's going to take an L. Just signed a big contract with the UFC. Um, she's just happy to be here making her, you know, 600K. And, um, yeah, Aaron's the side, man. I'm calling it head kick KO done. Wow. So I like the take. I like the take. Wouldn't necessarily get there myself. I have some marginal concerns about the Blanchfield striking side of things, but uh, I'm going to repeat something I've repeated many, many times before on this program, on this YouTube channel, which is them New York boys 
I'm going to teach you how to wrestle. Them New York girls, them New Jersey girls, they might just do the same damn thing. Um, Erin Blanchfield, very talented. Uh, I know the academies that she trains at. Silver Fox, um, very, very good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Um, Henzo Gracie affiliate. Their guillotine program is something I've studied in depth uh, because it's my favorite move. And their instructor is a literal genius for the guillotine. Uh, informed how Faraz Sahabi, uh, in part, trains his guillotine series and coaches it. Um, so really, really influential stuff. Aaron Blanchfield is phenomenal on the ground. You know, I thought that the Molly McCann fight, what, what it was going to show me was her level of physicality because Molly has offered resistance on the ground before. It's not like she's a complete uh, zero on the ground. It's normally just that she is a little bit one step behind her opponent, right? Um, I think it was the third round that Talia Santos was able to take her out of there uh, off the top of my head, right? It's like, it took some time. It took some wearing her down, getting to good positions. Aaron Blanchfield just routed her. It was a complete mismatch on the ground. She has very, very uh, poised jiu-jitsu. She has way more competition experience than a lot of ladies. Now, Jessica Andrade, the reason this is a fascinating fight is she's one of those ladies that has those experiences. She does have jiu-jitsu competition uh, live practice. She does have a jiu-jitsu-based camp where uh, Parane Valetudo, she trained there in Brazil. She brought a lot of her camp over to the States. She's done a lot of training in Vegas. So there's a lot of things that are positive about Jessica Andrade. Guys, if you remember back, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, one of my favorite calls ever, Jessica Andrade by sub. She hit it one of my favorite ways ever on Amanda Lemos, that standing arm triangle. I tried to hit that myself in competition. Homage to Jessica Andrade. I mean, she is an extremely uh, talented and influential fighter. She's been one of my most profitable fighters in the women's division for a long time because you give her these mismatches when she's a big favorite. She comes in and she delivers. That's the truth. Like you give her a fight that she should win. She normally wins and makes it look easy. Uh, that fight against Lauren Murphy, I expected it to be a little more competitive and she did a great job in that fight, but now she's making a rapid turnaround. She wasn't able to get the finish there. I think that's a little surprising for most people. And you look at somebody who's 38, 39, yeah, they're a junkyard dog, but like, that's the kind of person respectfully you're supposed to be finishing in this industry. That's what the UFC is here for. They're trying to usher some people out, former title challengers and things like this and usher in new people all the time, new stars. That's how they do it. Now they've got Jessica Andrade who has upside everywhere because they could just repackage her as a 115 pounder, where by the way, she has uh, you know, a former fight with the champion of the division where she has wins over relevant contenders in the top of the queue. And she has wins over top contenders at 125. So if she decides, you know what, I'm going to keep building my way up. You know, it's, it was a tough fight tonight. I shouldn't have taken it on a month's turnaround. That would be fine. Easily explainable away. She just took a huge pay increase, right? Because she's taking this under not ideal circumstances. One month of, of time in between, um, it's not really necessarily uh, enough, you know, it's not enough time to recover. It's not enough time to get another training camp in. Is she going to be at a peak physically for a five round contest that Aaron Blanchfield has been preparing for? And by the way, she wasn't preparing to fight some bump. She was preparing to fight the most recent title challenger who everybody acknowledged after the fact. Yeah, Liam, you were right. She almost beat her. She almost got her on the ground. She was not a plus 450 underdog. She looked like a plus 115 underdog, right? And now this girl, she was lined very closely with her. People open up the line, minus 190 on Andrade. Who who bets first, guys? Is it normally people that are uh, know-nothings? Is it people that have no idea what's going on in the sport? No, most of the time, people that attack those lines early, they're sharp. The line instantly came down. There was some resistance. Andrade backer said, no, I don't believe that. I'm, I'm coming in with my, my dollars the other way. And the line went back up. But where's the line now? Where's the line when limits opened up? Where's the line when people can bet real money on this fight? They're not taking plus 160 bets no more on Aaron Blanchfield right now. And I think that there's a chance uh, that it goes back out the other way. Jessica Andrade, much more public fighter, much more well-known fighter, has championship level fights. has been fighting in the UFC for a very long time. Is a staple, has wins at all these divisions. Again, I'm a Jessica Andrade fanboy. You go look at my betting record. I have not tried to get rich fading Jessica Andrade, but I'll tell you what. Sometimes you got to know when to get on and off the train. And last time out, I was not sure whether the Aaron Blanchfield train was rolling. It rolled right through the effing station. It was in her hometown in New York. Now they're sending her to Las Vegas, main event. Have we seen this blueprint before for fighters? Yeah. When they want to build them up, 
They put them in main events. They give them four former title challengers. They try and get them a huge win that can propel their career forward. Because by the way, they see that Valentina is on the verge of losing the strap. They saw that. They saw that a grappler could almost take that belt from her. And then they set up this girl, who's the next up-and-coming grappler in the division, to fight her and take her spot and show I'm a better grappler. If I could beat this girl, what could I do to your champion? Guys, come on. Just think think two steps ahead. I, I think that Blanchfield might close a pick here. I think it could go back the complete opposite direction with public money on Andrade. That's what I'm hoping for. But, yeah, I'd have to side with you here, Rich. I think that Aaron Blanchfield is the side. Am I saying that she can't get stopped in the feet? No. But am I saying – that when Jessica Andrade tends to lose her fights, it's because she gets overwhelmed in the early going by, by fighters that are able to match some of that physicality and also very skilled. You know, like Jessica Andrade, she's extremely physical. If you're afraid of Jessica Andrade, she's going to beat you into a pulp. But if you're willing to come forward, press her, and put her into dangerous situations, Amanda Lemos was whooping on her. And I think people forget that. Like, People have had real success. People have gotten on top of Jessica Andrade. People have been taken down, threatened subs from the bottom, and Jessica Andrade doesn't want to play on top no more. So for all those reasons, I, I think to myself, Erin Blanchfield, if she gets put on underneath in this fight, is going to be able to get back up to her feet. And I think that she is the much more dangerous fighter on top in this fight. So I like Erin Blanchfield. I don't think that the KO is out of question, but truthfully, I think this is going to be a submission. Um, I think that Jessica Andrade, you know, if she faces a ton of resistance here, she might find a way out. It's happened to her a few times. It, it's been a very long time, but it tended to happen to her up a weight when she didn't feel like she was the physically dominant fighter in grappling exchanges. It happened against Marion Renault, who was 37 at the time, well past prime. So I don't think this is like just a, a barrier to entry where, um, yeah, I think Glenbot might've hit the nail on the head. No distance. I mean, look at how this is being priced. It's a women's fight, guys. It's being priced 70% not to go to the decision. How common is that? It's very rare. We rarely see that. It's being priced at three and a half. It opened up. It got bet so heavily at three and a half to the under that it is now two and a half on most books. Again, why is that? It's because when Jessica Andrade wins and loses, she tends to do it early, more often than not. So I think uh, I expect this fight to be over in the first three rounds. I think it's going to be a fun fight. Um, but Bro. I think Aaron's going to get her hand raised. What do you think? You know, you know what's funny? You mentioned the Marion Renault fight. I mentioned that to somebody. Oh, it doesn't count. It was at 135. It's like the fight never existed. She didn't take that out. Like, people are so stupid, man, this week, the things they've been saying. And I'll tell you something else as well. People go on about Aaron. She's got shit stand up. They give these backhanded compliments, but she's improving, though. It's like, what disrespect, man? I think it's even on the feet. You know, people can call me an idiot. It's even on the feet, man. Fucking Aaron, bro. She fights like Khabib how he used to fight, you know, they're not in the orthodox stance. They're not in the southpaw. They're kind of straight on, which isn't um, ideal, obviously, but they give opponents something to think about. You know, um, look at when Khabib fought Connor. Um, his stand-up was obviously far inferior, but he stood for most of that fight. He even dropped Connor with a big right um, in the stand-up. And uh, Aaron fights a similar way, man. Um, I think people are really discounting it. They're really discounting these um, high kicks that she throws. They're very sneaky. Um, and she's going to fucking land one. And then you can all shut up and come back and tell me I'm the best. So, um, yeah, man. Aaron, get on it. I like it. So we could close it out there, man. Uh, great show. Uh, guys, like I mentioned, go ahead and support on social media. All of our information is in the description box below. If you're looking to get involved on a deeper level, uh, if you're looking to get first access to the information, this kind of deal, uh, all that information is below. want to mention on the way out as well, this show, all my content is brought to you by Prize Picks, guys. Simplest game in DFS. They've got lines for the UFC. They're already posted. All the other sports that you know and love, NBA, NFL, esports, all that stuff, prop projections. You use my promo code Liam. They will deposit match you 100% up to $100. And without further ado, Rich, please tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, catch me on um, Twitter, Just Win Baby. Um, anyone who wants to come chat some shit, DM me. Um, I've got a lot to say about Aaron, you know, if you want to discuss the fight or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you want my bets, um, check out the Patreon. There's a link on my um, Twitter. And uh, yeah, can't wait for Saturday, man. Love it. Uh, guys, I also just want to mention here on the way out, Lad VIP, my man Jonesy Trends been dropping videos uh, for the very first time. Please go show love and support at uh, J Jones, Jonesy Trends. Uh, and then my man Kamish Film Room, 
every day on YouTube, guys, dropping player props for you. Three player props a day. Um, very successful guy. So uh, appreciate you guys supporting uh, and appreciate men of the library. Never sell out, Liam. Keep doing your own thing. Of course, brother, uh, one day at a time. God bless you all. Enjoy those fights. Going to come back and do it all again next week. So best of luck on all your wagers. Always do so legally, responsibly within your means. Until next time, guys, come back. We'll do it all again. Take care.